John Krafchick is the man tasked with bringing Google's self-driving car project to life. He is a visionary, engineer, and innovator who made a tremendous impact at every stage of his career. At Ford, he worked in product management. After that, he served as CEO at Hyundai Motor America, where his invaluable experience led to his current position as CEO of Waymo. Waymo is a self-driving technology company with a mission to make it safe and easy for people and things to move around. Waymo stands for a new way forward in mobility. So, what does the future hold for autonomous vehicles? John Krafchick believes they will be on the road sooner rather than later. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome a pioneer in this new technology, John Krafchick. Joining John Krafchick is NADA President and CEO, Peter Welch. Not bad. Good to see you, Peter. See you, Jack. How are you? Good. Quite a beauty. What do you think? Yeah. All right. Let's wrap it up. So five years ago, you were on the same stage. Uh, of course, it was a little different capacity. You were the, the CEO of uh, Hyundai. That's right. Uh, what keeps your passion going in the auto business, John? I'll tell you, Peter, I have um, I've loved cars for as far back as I can remember. I was the last of eight kids, and all of my older, older siblings seemed to have this car bug. So I grew up um, with that. It's sort of imprinted on me, I guess. Um, but I went off to Stanford University and, and got a mechanical engineering degree. And not too long after that, I ended up knocking on the door of um, New United Motor, the GM Toyota joint venture in, in Fremont, California. Um, and that gave me an opportunity to work in the auto industry, and I loved it. Um, I went on and, and went to MIT and did some research work that gave me the opportunity to visit 90 different assembly plants around the world, and I got to meet all these automakers. It was, it was a lot of fun. Um, but from there, I uh, went on to work at Ford, um, did a lot of work on light trucks, and it, it's where I began to have this passion for safety and uh, understanding how we could make our cars um, safer and safer. And that strand continued as I moved on to Hyundai. I spent 10 years there. And um, I was super happy when the folks at Google reached out um, to ask me to lead the self-driving car project there. So tell us about Waymo. Why does it exist and what are you doing over there? Yeah, so um, going back to those, those early days, um, Waymo started as the Google self-driving car project back in 2009. So it's, it's over nine years old. Um, and if you go back to where we were as an industry, um, back in 2009, those weren't super awesome days um, for us, as you'll recall. Um, but the folks at Google, Larry Page and, and Sergey Brin, saw something in this evolving self-driving car technology. And does it make sense uh, for computers and sensors to, to drive cars? They had this extraordinary insight. Um, so they put a little team together um, and began to try and solve that problem. Um, because, well, you guys know it um, as, as well as Peter and I do. Um, there are so many, so many lives lost um, on roads today, nearly 40,000 people every year in the US, 1.25 million people die on roads around the world. It's like a 737 crashing every hour of every day, just traffic fatalities around the world. And so their point of view was maybe these human errors that we have, which comprise 94% of, of all accidents, Maybe we could make a dent in that through technology. Um, so they continued to invest in this technology and um, the project got better and better. Um, they passed a lot of trials internally um, until we got to the point where we felt safe enough to try putting a self-driving car on the road. So in 2015, I believe, it was the first year that you put an AV on the road. Uh, why was that a milestone? It's a super important milestone. So everything up until then had been um, with a safety driver um, in the car and we were testing the technology in that way. Of course, we did experiments um, on our own uh, proving ground in California, but we had never taken to 
public roads um, in a car. And I think we've got a video here, Peter and, and team, which I can take you through, which um, shows that historic first moment. Um, so what we're gonna roll here um, is the world's very first self-driving car, self car ride. So this is, um, this is Austin, Texas, October 2015. Um, and that's our little prototype car. We called it internally Firefly. Uh, it was also known as the Koala car. Um, and this is that very, very first drive on public roads with regular traffic, no safety net. This is Steve Mann, our lucky first rider. And the thing you need to know about Steve um, is he's blind. Um, and for him, um, this was a very, very special moment. We talk a lot about safety. You can hear Steve here. I don't know if you could hear him, but he said um, this was his first time in Austin where this took place. Um, but it was also his first time driving um, in a car in Austin. So for him, it was a very special moment. And it allowed us to, to demonstrate um, for the world, and by the way, we, we, we kept that secret uh, for about a year um, until we decided to share it with the world uh, because we wanted to continue to work on and refine that technology and move it from a research project um, to something more, to something that had real world commercial application. So speaking of Austin, um, I noticed just week before last down at the South by West, uh, South by Southwest uh, Festival, yeah. um, you released another video. Uh, yeah. Tell us about that one. That's right. So um, we'll cue this video in a minute, but um, so that was the sort of the ending of our research project phase as the Google self-driving car project. And it was that point that we thought, you know, we're getting ready um, to commercialize this project. So um, we moved um, the Google self-driving car project to become a separate entity um, um, as a part of Google, a, a broader company that we call Alphabet. And that company became Waymo, um, which is the name of the company and the brand you are slowly but surely seeing a little bit more and more of um, as time goes by. Um, so as Waymo, we have a focus now to bring this technology to the world and use it to help reduce um, traffic accidents and fatalities, to give mobility to people who don't have mobility now. And one of the ways that we've been doing that is in Phoenix, um, where we've put together um, a program we call the Early Rider Program. And so here we ask for volunteers, for people to help us define the future of self-driving. What should it look like? Um, what sorts of features do we need in cars like this self-driving Pacifica? Um, so that people can use them in their daily lives to move around the world. Um, within a few days of, of asking for hand raisers in Phoenix, we had 10,000, now we have 20,000 people who have signed up um, to join this service, which is great because we did that with no, no marketing dollars. Um, and what I want to show you now with this particular video, so we've been at this now for 10 or 11 months in Phoenix. Um, we're now letting people drive without anyone in the front seat. Um, in these Waymo cars. So this is our depot, um, and this is a car now that has left the Waymo depot. Um, there is no driver in the car, and these are some of our early riders um, moving into the Waymo Pacificas to move about the world and enjoy their daily lives. Um, we take um, some school kids to, um, to their classes. Um, we have folks who use it for shopping and getting back and forth to work. And this is a little bit of what the future looks like. I don't know how you feel about that. But there's no one in the driver's seat. So uh, everybody and their brother seems to be getting autonomous vehicles. So we've got all of the uh, more traditional OEMs are doing it. Uh, there are companies, some of your competitors are uh, seem to be into it. I noticed that there's some 20 different companies, some auto manufacturers, others in California alone that have registered in their program. Uh, what makes the Waymo technology different than the others? Yeah, it's, it's a great question, Peter. Um, I, I want to take a minute to, um, I want to answer that question, but I, I want to uh, reflect for just a moment on, on something that happened um, just this past Sunday in Tempe, Arizona. Some of you might have heard about it. Um, there was a tragic accident there. Um, and. It's something that um, makes us all, I think, feel a little bit sad. Um, 
uh, someone lost their lives, uh, someone lost, lost their life in a car um, that had self-driving technology in it. And for those of us at Waymo, um, it, was a very, it was a very sad day um, because that was an accident that was in a car that had technology um, representing the self-driving space. And for those of us at Waymo, um, it is that mission of safety and avoiding accidents just like that one that really bring us all together as a company. So it struck us, um, I think, in a very, a very, very major way. The company was founded on the principles of safety and mobility and access for all. Um, and we've dedicated ourselves to making this technology safe. Um, we've now driven on public roads over five million miles. Um, we put together this amazing testing program, um, which includes those public road miles. Um, we do a lot of work in simulation, over five billion miles of computer simulation, testing our software and our sensing. Um, we've developed tens of thousands of actual physical tests um, that really put our technology through its paces and ensure that it's that it's strong and capable and, of course, very, very safe. Would your uh, Waymo vehicle have reacted differently last Sunday uh, in Phoenix? Well, I want to I wanna be really respectful um, of, of Elaine, the, the woman who lost her life and her family. Um, I also want to recognize the fact that there are, there are many different investigations um, going on now um, regarding what happened in Tempe on Sunday. Um, Really, all, all that we can say at Waymo is, is based on our knowledge of what we've seen so far um, with that accident and our own knowledge of the robustness that we've designed into our systems. Um, and I can say with some confidence that in situations like that one with pedestrians, in this case a pedestrian with a bicyclist or with a bicycle, um, we have a lot of confidence that our technology would be robust and would be able to handle situations like that one. So if you can, tell me about what your business model is. What's your ultimate business model? Is it to develop uh, the artificial intelligence and the operating system and license that to more traditional uh, OEMs? Or is it your mission to uh, own and operate, maybe even manufacture fleets of self-driving robots? Yeah. I think um, the easiest way to think about what we're doing is um, to think of it in, in this context. Our goal is really to build drivers. We want to build the world's most experienced drivers. Um, and we believe those drivers can be applied to all sorts of different modes of transportation. So in that context, um, uh, we have four different business lines that we're thinking of. The first is um, what you see here with this Waymo Pacifica and what you saw in that video. Um, we're building a transportation service that can move people from point A to point B, um, anywhere they might want to go in the areas that we serve. And our first market for that will be Phoenix. Um, we also think the technology works really well for um, moving goods um, from place to place. So um, imagine trucking and logistics. Um, you might have seen some of our Waymo Peterbilt trucks, Class 8 trucks with, uh, with big trailers. Um, that we're now using in Atlanta to move goods um, from point A to point B there. Um, we're also working now with cities. Um, cities are very interested in the technology, um, connecting people in their homes or at work um, to existing forms of public transportation. Um, so from a city's point of view, uh, the questions to us are, how can this Waymo technology help improve public transportation, which is something we're pretty excited about. Um, the fourth one I think might be of, of direct interest to, uh, to many of you here, and that is we are interested and we have been working with some OEMs on ways to license this technology to apply to personal use vehicles as well. So those are the, the four business lines we're thinking of now, Peter. So on the subject of uh, personally owned uh, and operated vehicles, as, as you know, you've been in the business a long time. The, um, you know, the current split is about 70%, 30% personal ownership, retail sales versus um, fleet, uh, which of course fleet would include uh, ride hail, yeah. ride sharing, um, traditional fleets and whatnot. Um, I guess maybe a two part question. One is the unknown question about 
when our AV is actually going to be on the road. But more importantly, I guess, from dealers are, how do you see that shift uh, going? Is it going to go, and let's say over the next 5, 10, 15 years, I mean, it, is, is the percentage of personally owned vehicles going to dramatically change? Yeah, this is a great question. I, I think it's something that's on everyone's mind these days. Um, you know, to the question of when will AVs arrive on the roads, um, these cars are on the roads now. And I think what you're going to see um, uh, companies like Waymo doing um, is putting these, these vehicles, because the technology is still relatively expensive, it makes sense to put them into to ride sharing, um, shared mobility fleets, because then we can use those cars around the clock. Um, it turns out that for the cars we sell as personal use cars, um, they sit idly about 95% of the time. And when you've got a car like this Waymo Pacifica with all of its technology on it, you really want to use it a lot to get the value back to society for, for all, of that, um, all of that asset value that's in the car. Um, more broadly, as we think about where the industry is going to go, yeah, it's probably fair to say that as you look at total industry, um, the percentage of retail versus fleet um, is going to change. Um, and you will, we'll see increasing fleet mix, commercial use mix, ride hailing. Um, it'll start with manned ride hailing. Um, the folks you know, like companies like Lyft, um, are going to be, um, those Lyft drivers are going to be consuming more and more cars to put into service um, in a ride sharing mode. These people may present to you in many cases as regular personal use buyers, um, but I think you'll also see um, companies like Lyft um, buying more of these cars in bulk. Um, in what might look like fleet deals. Um, so I think the future, yeah, probably holds increasing fleet mix going forward. And, and how long do you think it's going to take uh, to see the price of the vehicles come down significantly? For the, for the automated technology yeah. and the self-driving technology? Um, at Waymo, I can tell you we're on, uh, think of it as a, a two-year um, technology replacement cycle. Um, we are taking a lot of cost um, out of the system, so it won't be too long um, before vehicles like this one um, are actually in your showrooms um, in a way that you could sell to a personal use buyer. So uh, my understanding uh, is that most of the vehicles in the test deployment are on so-called geo-fenced areas and whatnot. That's right. But when do you see true level fives that are going to be out uh, yeah. swimming around with the rest of the vehicle population. So for those of you who aren't, aren't familiar with, uh, with the, tech, the technical terms in level four and level five, um, these, are, these are SAE terms for the level of automation in the car. Um, this car that you're looking at here, we consider level four. That means it's fully automated. It doesn't need a human driver in the driver's seat, but its limitation is within a certain geographically bounded zone. Um, so for example, um, when we roll out our Phoenix service, um, completely, the cars will be clear to drive in about a 600 square mile area that comprises Greater Phoenix, um, but the cars won't be able to drive outside of that area. That's perfect uh, for ride sharing mobility service, but it not, might not be so great for a personal use buyer who's going to want to drive outside of Phoenix every now and then. Um, so there are a couple of ways to think about that. You could still sell a level four car for someone who lives in Phoenix, and they could use it in a self-driving mode for most of their driving. Um, and when they want to leave that area, um, they could just drive it manually. Um, I think the industry is sort of mixed on whether we'll ever see a true level five vehicle. And level five means the car can drive anywhere, at any time, in, in any weather condition. Sometimes we joke internally, we humans aren't even level five. I don't know what you think about that. Um, but you know, we'll see. I think the level five technology is, is a very, very long way out. And how have the citizens of Phoenix reacted to, to the Waymo fleet? Um, you know, we've, we've been driving um, now for a while in Phoenix, a couple of years, and in, and in Mountain View in the Bay Area for, for nine years. And what we've heard consistently um, from the folks who live amongst these cars, because you do, you see them all over the roads of Phoenix and all over the Bay Area these days, um, they appreciate the consistency of the car. So I mentioned we're building the world's most experienced driver. That driver is the same exact driver in all of our cars, and they drive exactly the same way. So if you're a human driver and you come across a Waymo car, you'll have a lot of confidence in how it's going to handle a stoplight or a stop sign or a certain tricky intersection because it always does it the same way every time. 
Well, that's good. Well, uh, we have another special guest uh, that's going to join us here. Um, and we thought we'd mix it up and we might even, you know, double team it here uh, when, when we bring Mike out. Uh, but Mike Jackson, of course, is no stranger to, to the group. In fact, he's our largest single member. Uh, and uh, there's Mike right there, the CEO of uh, Auto Nation. And it was... Uh... Good to see you, Mike. Don, how are you? Michael. Hey there. And you have one thing in common, seven years ago, he was our keynote speaker here. Uh, I think it was in Orlando uh, when we saw you, Mike. Uh, but really, before I get going, um, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, that one of the icons of our industry, um, uh, a close personal friend of yours, in fact, the founder of AutoNation, uh, succumbed to a long battle with cancer just yesterday, Wayne Hazinga. Uh, and we're sorry for his loss and, and the industry's loss on it. He's a remarkable man. Yes, indeed, he was my best friend. He was best man at my wedding. And um, he was one of the most fun individuals to, to hang with. He had a keen intellect and uh, a marvelous sense of humor. When it comes to business, though, he was an absolute visionary. Uh, there's many entrepreneurs in this world, in this room, that I have great admiration for. But Wayne was the greatest entrepreneur in the world and one of the greatest of all time. And he created three Fortune 500 companies from scratch and a dozen other companies to talk about, owned three sports teams uh, at the same time. And um, AutoNation will have many, many CEOs over the decades, but we will always have only had one founder, and that's Wayne. And our main conference room is, is a tribute to Wayne. It's called the Founders Room. And we have a big portrait of Wayne on the wall. And we have our meetings there, and we get stuck and can't find an answer we have this saying in the company, you know, what would Wayne do? And we sort of stare at the painting. Uh, but it does take the level of conversation to a, to a, to a whole new energy. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, the creativity flows and all of a sudden you've gotten to a better place. So last November, I picked up the Auto News and read the story that uh, Auto Nation had ended a partnership uh, with, with Waymo. Um, maybe the both of you can, uh, what, what's the genesis of that? How, how, how did that deal come down? Well, I actually went to Google X before John. I, I started visiting there six or seven years ago because uh, I had a, a, a curiosity as to exactly what they were doing. And before I knew what is that on the 101, uh, in an autonomous vehicle with the ori original engineers that started it and discussing exactly how they were approaching it. And I found it absolutely fascinating. So I continued to visit them. And what really impressed me uh, was one, I liked that it was Google doing it with uh, deep pockets because I knew it was going to be a long, mm -hmm. difficult journey. Mm -hmm. uh, second, that it was a, a passion of the founders of Google uh, to make the world a better place, to save lives uh, and reduce fatalities. And, and so I knew they wouldn't give up. And then what really uh, earned my respect is they didn't take any shortcuts. They profoundly understood the difficulty, the complexity of what they were doing, and that they needed this capability to work 99.9999999% of the time. And um, they also had an epiphany at a certain point where they said this idea uh, that you have an autonomous system with, with a supervisor in the vehicle or behind the wheel isn't going to work, that uh, you're almost asking too much of the human being. It's, 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 like, it's easier just to drive your car yourself than to supervise a system. And so they said, no, the system has to be capable of doing, doing it itself. Now, in this journey of visits, I always say, well, Okay, you know me, I'm a car guy. So how do you commercialize it? Was it? And they had no idea. So when they, when they approached John, I think you and I talked even before you went. We truth, truth be known. Truth be known. <laughs> truth be known. Uh, John and I go back uh, 20 years. John holds the record for addressing our board for three different companies. Three different companies. <laughs> <laughs> one day, uh, oh, what was that, a true car, I think? We left one of them Yeah, we had a little yeah. dust up there. <laughs> yeah. And Waymo. I said, well, this is it. And, I, and um, uh, so my thinking is, if I look at AutoNation as a company, the marketplace is 75 personal use. That's where we are today. And then I look at the 25% shared use, and that's everything from buses to taxis to rental cars. And clearly, a company like Waymo is, go is going to disrupt shared use 
to a great extent that if I could have added value with Waymo, then I'm in 100% of the marketplace. And ultimately, where that line goes between sharing and personal use, I'm in the game. So with the relationship I had with John, I called him up and I said, hey, I think I can have added value. I mean, these things cost a small fortune and they're gonna to have to be on the road for 250, 300,000 miles and you need a, a partner uh, to manage the care of each individual to make sure it's safe and reliable on every given day and it's, and it's gonna be out there for 250, 300,000 miles. That's, that's so we started it. Was it a single source bidding process or how, how did you <laughs> pick him? You know? Well, I, I wanna amplify one of the things that um, that Mike said, and, and it's true that we need partners in this business. Um, and I should make it clear to everyone that um, we're a self-driving technology company. We're specifically not a car company, right? Um, and we, we believe our role in the world is to help make these drivers. It's to not make cars. Um, and to do that well, we're gonna have to have great partners, um, like AutoNation. We don't want to establish um, our own facilities to work on these cars. That doesn't make any sense. Um, AutoNation and other dealers around the country are gonna have those facilities to help us do that. Um, there are plenty of car companies already on the planet, so we don't need to make our own cars, we'll partner with them. Um, that's been our approach going forward. So my message is, uh, if, if, if I was sitting out there, is these vehicles are extremely complex. And if I look at the, at the future, hybrid electrics and all these other types of vehicles have a complexity that's almost unimaginable. And that if you can manage uh, complex technical products with added value, you have a future. You have a future. And that's the way I think about it. So I find it, I find I'm more excited. I'm not in this, um, oh, woe is me, the sky is falling. I'm looking at all this and saying, I, I can get into a bigger part of the marketplace, they're extremely complex. I have the technical expertise to do it, and I want to be in early so I understand it. We have an iterative process going on where we find the right line between what Waymo does and what we do. Uh, so it's very exciting. I'm very excited. Well, about you certainly have a history of uh, forward leaning uh, and, and being innovative. Uh, do you see autonomous vehicles as a threat to the dealer model? Uh, no. Here's here. Here's. I sort of have things figured out between now and 2030, and I'm, and I'm working on 2030, 2040, but let's just do stake in the ground for 2030. Good. But I see, and we'll move on to 2050. Yeah, we'll do that next month. <laughs> so you have this um, moment where you have several technologies or inflection points at the same time. Electrification, autonomous, uh, connectivity, and, and the business concept of sharing. Um, and that gives the industry in, in its totality for the first time in the history to be able to comprehensively address its social costs of fatalities and pollution. And what we're doing today really isn't sustainable. So, so I view that as extremely good. Now, the rate of adoption is going to be driven by the economics and the economics are upside down for all of that at the moment. Uh, Uber loses a small fortune on, on sharing. Electrification is 10 years away from uh, economic equivalency with an internal combustion engine. Autonomous has several generations to go through, in my opinion, before uh, it, it's in the market. But so, so if you put it all out there, there'll be a, a, a gradual adoption rate. It will be more disruptive in big, dense cities than in, uh, in the suburbs. Uh, but if you find a way to get in the game and participate in the game, I think you can uh, have, have a far more opportunity than we have today. So tell us a little bit about the nitty gritty of actually what you do for Waymo. I mean, have you got dedicated service bays? Do you have to recertify your, uh, your techs? Uh, what can well, you we, tell us about it? We definitely have a certification uh, program for our technicians. Uh, first, all our technicians are certified at different levels of skill. Uh, there's an AutoNation system and a pay scale that's linked to certification. Uh, and the highest levels then are, you can graduate into uh, working on Waymo vehicles. And we have three different classifications with Waymo and we have a development training program that we've worked out with Waymo that we do together for our technicians. Here you see a group of them right here. Uh, and we're off and running. now. I like the way John and I work together. It's an iterative process. We say, listen, we don't know exactly where the line is that who does what. 
but every 10 days the teams meet and discuss who's doing what and uh, what John said is very true. He's looking for partners where he has his added value and we have our added value. And I can tell you, you should be rooting for us. The line, the amount that we have taken on goes up all the time, which is good. You know, listen, I don't do computers. I mean, I don't, that's not my thing. I'm not designing the thing. But you want it to work every day? You want me to maintain it? Do you want everything to be just right? I'm your guy. So we're in that. And would you say, John, it's working Absolutely. extremely well. Yeah. And our added value is, is increasing. It is indeed. Um, so the, in terms of the work that Mike's doing for us in the AutoNation team, um, we've had things just like bull transmission replacement. Yeah. Um, windshield repairs, of course the, the daily preventive maintenance, and it's one of the things that we're going to be leaning into dealers as a whole, starting with AutoNation, um, ways to extend the vehicle life. Um, this vehicle becomes a lot more valuable to us if we can extend the life beyond 150,000 miles to 250,000 and 300,000 miles. And frankly, you're the experts on how to do that. That's probably not something that's, that's within Waymo's skill set. So that's something that that we're leaning heavily into uh, AutoNation and our relationship. And we're very optimistic we're going to be able to hit those numbers. I don't know whether this is good news or bad news for you, but the Waymo driver takes less wear and tear on a vehicle than a human being. You've programmed this car to be very polite, very courteous, ease on the brakes, don't over-accelerate, have all the patience in the world, don't squeal the tires, yes. none of that. None of that. So these things come in with all these miles and we say, <laughs> you know, it doesn't show any wear and tear compared to what you would see on a customer car mm. at 30,000 miles. It's that interesting. Said, but a lot of these miles are, um, they will probably not be heavily highway miles. So they're going to be primarily city and, and suburban miles. Um, and we're going to be racking up a lot of miles. So we may hit in just four years maybe less, 300,000 miles of service or yeah. not. So they're going to be good trades then, huh? <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think they're going to be good trades. I, I believe, you could correct me if I'm wrong, I believe at the end, they're done. I think you're going to run them to... That's the goal. You're yeah. going to run them till they're done. Yeah. Because, look at this baby I over there. A lot of competitors that would want to buy them off your used car lot. You know? Yeah, I, I, don't, uh, I don't think they're going to end up there. That's <laughs> my... Gut. If you look at this vehicle, if you look at the investment that John has made in this vehicle to replace the driver, uh, it's considerable. Yeah. So speaking of investment, so what kind of investment did you have to make in the partnership? Um, well, it's not like I had to do an OEM image program. I mean, that's the world I live in, right? So that's coming, Mike. The way. <laughs> no, 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 nice John. Program. You're you're ex OEM, right? So uh, it, don't come with any. Uh, investment asks that make no economic sense. I would, I would ask that. Yeah. So don't go down that road. I live that, we live that every day. So uh, it's quite reasonable and fair. Now we're not, I should be clear, we are not looking to make money uh, with, with our Waymo relationship. It's an investment, if I, if I can break even, I'm happy with that. Mm. Uh, and, we, and, and we're very cost effective and John's very, he's got a business model that has to pencil, so we have to hit these numbers. Uh, so it's an investment period, it's a learning period uh, that we're each going through. And if I can break even, I'm very happy with that. And I'm thinking, what happens five, six years from now? That, that we as a company have an understanding and an expertise in this business. So how many cities are you working on? Well, we're in Phoenix. Goes, that, right. That's we're where we started, right? And um, we've done hundreds of repairs so far of everything you can, can imagine. Can you give an idea how, how large the fleet and is? And just what, I just want to—it's a good collision business. <laughs> <laughs> so, but people hit you, right? Because yeah, yeah people are hitting. You can add the wrong idea. Um, <laughs> but we, you know, we to your question, Peter. So we we've tested now in twenty-five different cities. Um, and the way we're going to roll out our business is starting in Phoenix, um, we'll add a second market sometime this year. Um, and then as each year goes by, we'll be adding more and more markets as we move across the U.S. and eventually into um, international markets. So when they're out 
operating even in a geofenced environment. You know, w one of the issues I know I've had some discussion with some of your counterparts are is, is the in fact the artificial intelligence. In fact, somebody in fact I'll say Mercedes was saying you know they were concerned because they were so polite that uh, you might never get to the sporting event because everybody learns to pull in front of you and they just keep going back, 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 and back. Uh, and how are your cars going to operate with human-operated vehicles in the same lane on the same freeways? Yeah, so a couple of points on that. One is um, we understand there are times when you have to provide a certain social posture in driving to signal your intentions. Um, so we as humans often, often encounter this at four-way stops um, where you move your car forward just a little bit so the folks around you understand that is your intention to go next. Our cars can do this. Um, we have the same technology as we often nudge out um, into traffic um, if we're taking a right-hand turn, for example. So we use that body posture, that body language to signal socially uh, to the other road users that we're, we're ready to move on. And Danny DeVito is going to program the New York cars as you go do something well, have, like We that. have the special Danny DeVito programming <laughs> algorithm for New York, that's right. Interesting stuff. So we have a lot of dealer members. So what about the opportunities for the rest of our members uh, to either do business with you or your competitors? So um, it's something to think about. As we grow our business, it's going to be a community-based set of locations that we're serving. So we're starting in Phoenix. We want that business to have a Phoenix feel and relate well to the local community. Um, our next market will be another city that will have another feel. Um, and as we move out through many, many communities across the US, we're gonna come upon markets where we're going to want to partner with many of you um, to help us in the same way that Mike is helping us um, with the AutoNation team. Um, I think that's one way to think about your opportunity to partner with us going forward. Uh, Mike, we've both ridden in Waymo cars. I mean, well, what do you personally think about riding in a, in a robot car? Well, first, uh, I'm, a, I'm a dynamic driver. Uh, we're both 911 guys, Porsche 911s. We, we love to drive. We're passionate about driving. So it's, it's not something that comes naturally to me. and It's not something I would normally choose to do. However, I will say, as far as winning over a confidence, it happens very quickly. You are surprised how quickly you feel trust and safe and free to do something else. Mm -hmm. And I could, I could foresee the time where I would like to have that capability in a vehicle where, yes, I can drive it, enjoy it and everything else, but then there'll be times when I want to do other things and I don't have a driver and I push a button and it takes over for me. I think if we're really, really honest with ourselves, and I know we're all car people in the room right now, but um, for any drive that you might have to do, for the most part, if you had the choice between being driven there so that you could do whatever you wanted to do, talk to someone, think deeply, watch a movie, who knows what it might be, um, you would probably take that option. Yeah, drive me there. I know there are times, too, um, where you want nothing more than to get into your 911 Turbo, right, Mike? Yeah. And Turbo S. Turbo S, okay, <laughs> Turbo S. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just Go. take it up the PCH or whatever on a Sunday yeah. morning um, with a Starbucks in the, in the cup holder, right? There, there are times you want to drive, but for the most part, I think we would prefer being... So the way I think about it, though, Peter, is that... So where this service will disrupt first are those who are already sharing. So take New York City, Manhattan. That's the most extreme case. If you have a choice of going down into the subway or getting in a Waymo at a affordable price, you're going to get in the Waymo before you go down in the subway. And are you going to wait for a bus or are you going to get into a Waymo? Are you going to get into a 30 taxi with someone who does, doesn't speak necessarily understand where you want to go, or are you going to get into Waymo that immediately responds to your request? So I think where you're going to disrupt first are those who already are in a sharing world. I think there you're walking through open doors. Then when you get to suburban areas and, and personal use, then I think it's another whole story. 
So how long do you think it takes until um, autonomous vehicles get out into rural areas vis-a-vis? -vis. I happen to agree you're going to go urban, ex-urban, rural. We see, just a comment, we, we talk to city developers who are, and, and those who run public transportation, are already feeling the impact of Lyft and Uber on public transportation and what it means to them. And now you just take it to the next step, that there's not a driver in the vehicle and it's even more cost effective and pleasant. It's an impact on public transportation. You're talking in, in dense areas. Yeah, I, it, it's certainly true in um, less dense areas. It's, it's difficult at times for, for public transportation to make viable economic sense, right? Well, what are autonomous vehicles going to, get, going to do to public transportation? I think the, the request that we're hearing from cities right now um, paint a happier picture maybe, Mike, than, than where you're going, right? Because um, we do have public transportation infrastructure in our cities. Um, sometimes they're, they're used very well, like in, if you, you mentioned New York City and the subways there. Um, in other cases, utilization isn't so great. And in those cases, it's often because people have a hard time getting to the public transportation itself. And so we see ourselves as a, as a really interesting solution for that, that last mile problem, moving people from their homes or from work um, to those main um, corridor public transportation lines. Well, of course, the most expensive component of, of rideshare right now is, in fact, the driver. So if you take the driver out, I assume that the price can come dramatically down. Um, so why would anybody take public transportation if it was cheaper and more convenient to do rideshare in an autonomous vehicle? Oh, I think, um, you know, it, it, we haven't done the study ourselves on, on, on the, the, the cost of, of public transportation, but for the systems that are there where society has already written the check, um, I think it makes sense to use that asset. Um, and that is one of the primary messages we have at Waymo. There is so much existing infrastructure in the world that we can activate and make better um, through application of this driver in some of the modes that we're talking about. So we'd rather think about it in terms of how can we make this existing public transportation asset work even better um, by applying this technology to bring people to it. So one, one insight I'd like to give you is you, see, you read many of these studies that are very aggressive as to how autonomous vehicles are gonna replace personal transportation. Uh, there's an assumption in there which I really question uh, on how they get the cost down per mile. And that is that the vehicle is being shared with others. It, it's a carpool vehicle. So to me, asking America, it's, it's one thing in what you described, that you have this nice vehicle that you're taking, to, now you can do other things, and now you share it with four strangers in order to get the economic cost down. I think the adoption rate on that is going to be much less than what some of these studies say. I, think, I don't think the American people come naturally to carpooling. And there's a, there's a lot of inefficiency to pick up other passengers. You lose a lot of time, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, there, I think, and there are interesting solutions to that too. And, and it's true, I think people, some people are comfortable um, with others, others want no, I just, their own. Just pointing out, be careful when you say sharing yeah. that you're getting in this thing with a bunch of strangers. Hmm. Well, I, we certainly get that. No, I, I would pay the premium and have it all to myself. But. And I think That's people <laughs> underestimate the, the expense of inconvenience and the time you have to wait in between intervals of rides and how long it takes for an Uber to show up and where you have to go and what's your value of time and so on and so forth with it. But of course, as car dealers, uh, I often say you're merchants. Uh, you stock, sell, and service what uh, your, our customers want to own, drive, uh, uh, and be in. Uh, so I guess it really doesn't matter what the propulsion system is. Uh, or whether there's a driver or whether it's self-driving. Uh, in fact, most of the studies that we've commissioned and, and have done indicate that uh, our customers want everything. Uh, they, want, uh, they want to own the car, uh, they want it autonomous if it's safe, uh, they want to have ride share, uh, they want to have all sorts of mobility services. Um, I think it's been kind of interesting because I had our economics department take a look at it and we've seen a steady rise since the Great Recession in the number of uh, vehicles owned per household. It's almost up to two vehicles again, it's just a shade right. under yeah, it. It's 2.21 and going back, Peter, to 2030 for a minute. So if there's 255 million vehicles on the road to America today, by 2030 there'll be 275 million vehicles on the road. So the units in operation is going to continue to grow. 
the complexity of the vehicles is going to go. And, and you see this whole electrification question. Well, the majority of those are going to be hybrid electrification, which is even more complicated because you have an internal combustion and engine mm -hmm. and an electrical system in one vehicle. And I, and I just look at that as a, as a retailer and as one who repairs vehicles and say, uh, there's, going to, there's plenty of opportunity there. That's great opportunity. Plenty of opportunity. Now, going back to your city planner uh, talk, uh, we're already getting uh, questions uh, uh, from some of our metro associations and whatnot when they go to city council meetings where they don't want to approve parking lots uh, under the theory that, oh, it's all going to be ride share, as you say, uh, uh, Uber and Lyft and so on. D does this become a self-fulfilling prophecy that you know, cities don't approve parking lots, so then it's less convenient to drive? And you know, how does that all work? You know, it's interesting, um, this factoid, so we've got a car park that's close to 300 million cars. You said about 250 now, 250, 250 million cars. Um, on average, each car in the U.S. has four parking spaces reserved for it. So we have a billion parking spaces in the U.S. right now. Um, and it really does impact the look and feel of cities. Um, so it, it, it may not be a crazy idea um, for city planners to think about that, right? To restrict the number of parking spaces. And I'm talking about dense urban areas now, as opposed to suburban and rural areas. Um, so that we don't have that much of an impact on cities as we have. I mean, that is something that I think uh, it might be difficult for us to reflect on, but the car has so shaped the way our cities in the U.S. have evolved, you know? But that is the infrastructure that you're operating in today it may evolve into the future right. uh, and of course one of the concerns we have particularly in our major metro areas I know I spent most of my career in, in California Los Angeles I mean we got eight lanes going each way and uh, it's very difficult um, and of course most of the pundits that I see are, are predicting oh this is going to be the solution to congestion and I'm thinking more like Mike's thinking that geez if I could own an AV uh, and now I can empower a lot more drivers. I can have infirm people, blind people like you saw in your spot uh, and whatnot on it. It seems to me that it creates more vehicle owners. And if in fact the pundits are not right and people want ride share, but they also want to own, assuming the price will come down, I believe that they will. After all, if it's true that it's electrification, there's gonna be fewer parts on them, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So what does that do? To the infrastructure of the future, and you know, is that going to impact uh, acceptability of, of autonomous? Well, Peter, I'm in more your camp. I, I listen to this and I read these studies, and I, I say I, I think I don't think it helps congestion at all. Now, the, the one assumption they make is they put more people per vehicle riding around. That's how they get fewer. That's how they get less congestion. And I'm highly skeptical that that's gonna be embraced by Americans in a big way. Other than that, I think you, you have a new choice that attracts away from public transportation. You also have the, this inefficiency that shared vehicles like an Uber, let's say Uber or Lyft, they're empty 40% of the time that they're moving because there's an inefficiency between where they drop somebody off and where they have to pick up the next passenger. So that then is an empty vehicle moving on the road. Because there's no, no parking purpose. spots. I think, no I think the reality is- we So I'm in your camp. I don't, I don't see the congestion going away and it'll be far more than three trillion miles uh, by 2030. That three trillion miles is a reference to how many miles we drive as Americans every year right now. It's about three right. trillion miles, 10 trillion miles globally. I think we'll see um, you know, what happens um, because we honestly don't know. Um, the world hasn't seen a vehicle like this one that can drive itself around. Um, and we haven't yet had the opportunity to really test it um, in the real world and see how these sharing options work. Because you're right, Mike, um, we do see in our models too um, better economics, both for the business, but also for society and for individuals through shared usage um, and avoidance of all of the costs of personal car ownership might be appealing to some, not all, um, but some. How it all shakes out in the end, it's part of this grand experiment. Yeah, we'll see. So we understand when we read the paper about a lot of the hype and of course when you pull the curtain back we know that at the end of the day they're mechanical parts. I mean I had my uh, Outlook uh, 
uh, computer program crashing me on Monday, and I'm glad I wasn't driving it. Uh, but we also all know what's coming. And we, uh, you just look at the technology that we see with cell phones and so on and so forth. So um, I will have to tell you, I think we've all been in this business uh, a pretty long time. I can't remember a more exciting time. Uh, and when there's new technologies, there's new opportunity. Uh, and uh, I, for one, uh, think the dealers have an incredible opportunity uh, going forward uh, because more cars on the road, more sophistication, more maintenance intervals, that's what we do. That's right. So, I could not agree more, Peter. Well, I agree. You got any closing thoughts or observations? I think it is an extraordinarily exciting time. I don't think you could have said it better, um, Peter. We have all of this change. Um, we have an upward trend line for the vehicle population in the car park. That's un unquestioned. Um, and now we have this amazing new technology that's adding new options um, for folks who move around the world. I think it's going to be a, a pretty interesting time for you dealers. Great. Well, Thanks you think that, that, could this rig drive us back to the hotels? I think, well, why don't we hop in? Yeah, oh. yeah. We'll, just, we'll, we'll take the <laughs> Good. car back. Thank you so much for your time, folks. Thanks, Thanks everybody. You. Thank you. That was great. That was Jordan. Fun. Peter. Thank you. Excellent Good. job, Peter. Good. Thank you. Good. What an interesting conversation. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us today. Now don't forget, tomorrow morning is our inspirational session. It's also the day to support our troops. The doors open at 8.15 and our session begins at 9 a.m. Enjoy the NADA show and the rest of your day.